you all joining us today in person and online. My name is Kristen Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the Wool Bar Association. And this is one of our series of forums that we're producing to talk about issues that are important to our community, important to our members as well. Um, I want to thank, first of all, our co-sponsors today, the Women Lawyers Association and the Charles W. Anderson Chapter of the National Bar Association. Uh, we really appreciate their support in helping us promote this and helping us uh, uh, give the opportunity to their members to ask some questions for Dr. Polio. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to him and let him make his remarks, and we will ha have time for questions at the end. If you are watching online and would like to submit some questions, you can do so over our Facebook Live. Uh, we've got somebody who's monitoring that account and will be uh, sending the questions up for us at the end. So without any further ado, Dr. Marty Polio. All right, thank you very much, Kristen. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be here with you today to talk a little bit about our student assignment plan. I thought we were going to have a room full of attorneys, but uh, so they're going all my jokes, baby. Okay, we're all gone now. So, but I'm uh, happy to be here today. Uh, and thank you for everyone who's online watching. I really would encourage you uh, to submit questions that you have. I think it's very important that we discuss student assignment or any other questions that you have that you'd like to ask about JCPS. I'm here to answer those questions. Give a round of applause to our board member, James Craig, for walking in the building. There you go. Uh, right on time. So um, we will start with student assignment, but I am open to, I am open to answering any questions. So please submit those. Uh, I would like to spend at least the second half of this um, talking about our fielding questions from, uh, from you online or here in the room. So please don't hesitate to do that about student assignment or anything else. I'm proud to answer questions about Jefferson County Public Schools. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about why student assignment, why we changed student assignment. Then I'm gonna get into the history of it a little bit because I think it's important to understand the history and how unique it is to Jefferson County. Um, first and foremost, I became acting superintendent in July of 2017. And so uh, I was a principal, longtime principal here in JCPS, now been in the district for 26 years. And so during that time as principal, I got a firsthand look at many of the great things happening in JCPS and many of the changes that needed to be, to be, needed to be made. Um, and that gave me a unique perspective. So there are positives for hiring a superintendent from within the district, and that is one of those. Having that unique perspective of working with students in schools in Jefferson County for two decades. Spent my career at Shawnee High School, Wagner High School, 
principal at Jaytown High School for eight years, and then principal at Doss High School for two years. So it gave me a very unique perspective, at least from the high school level of student assignment and many other foundational issues uh, that needed to be changed in JCPS. And I think it's important to note, um, change is difficult in this district, in this community. First of all, change is difficult in any organization uh, that has nearly 100,000 students, 17,000 employees, five different unions involved uh, in representing those employees, um, you know, and uh, so many entities and families and community involved. So change is difficult. Um, and JCPS has been averse to change for many, many years. And so when I got this job in uh, July of 2017 in the permanent position, in April of 2018, which puts me at a little over four years from now, I knew we had to make some significant change. Honestly, though, I had no idea what I was doing. I was principal stepping into this role, uh, pretty good at faking it for a little bit, but learned quickly and had to learn quickly about being a superintendent here in a large urban school district. Uh, quickly realized, you know, wanted to make change, wanted to make positive change, focused on outcomes for students but also began to see that what had happened is we had had no change, no significant change in this district since I stepped in my first day of class on August 15, 1997 at Shawnee High School. So when I look back at 97, which, you know, 25 years ago, the major you know, initiatives have come and gone, the way we, you know, some programs had come and gone, superintendents had come and gone, but when I really looked at how the school day was designed, where kids were assigned to go, the facilities in which students were being a part of, how we trained and hired teachers had really not changed in the better part of 25 years. And so we had to make that change. And so bringing together a team and working on what I call, what is our current state year in JCPS? What are the things that need to change to move student outcomes? And then the future state, what, are, what do we want it to look like in 2025 that is gonna give us the outcomes that we want in this community? All the while knowing that um, in communities all across America, we are dealing with children right now who have more issues, problems, um, things that need to be dealt with. The homeless population is increasing. In my two decades in JCPS, the free and reduced lunch population has increased from about 48% to where we are now, which is close to 70%. And so we have to, as a community, say seven out of 10 kids in our community, Louisville, Kentucky, 2022, live at what we would consider in education to be below the poverty line. Now, there's a dispute of what that is, free and reduced lunch may not be that best measure, but that's where it is. And so all of that happening, also a pandemic going on. But what we did in 2019 is identify a future state in JCPS that we wanted around six different areas that we thought were so important to change in JCPS. First of all, facilities. Um, our facilities, and, and I could do a whole presentation on that, I won't. Uh, it's an embarrassment to our community. We have not invested in our facilities. Uh, a multitude of schools that are beyond life, haven't built a new high school since 19. 68, hadn't built a new middle or high school in West Louisville since 1952. I could go on and on with the problems and the lack of investment in facilities. It's time to change. We are so far behind most major cities in the United States on our facilities. Second of all, learning time. If we're gonna catch students up, we've got to increase learning time. Cities all across America were doing summer programming, summer camps for every kid. Didn't have to pay. It wasn't just for a few hundred of selected kids. It needed to be 10, 20,000 kids. We have accomplished that task a lot with ESSER funds. We have 10,000 kids right now today and summer learning actually ends on Friday. So we're very proud of that. That puts us on the forefront. Technology, you know, making sure that every student has a, a laptop and accessible to the internet wherever they go at all times. And not just students of means having access. That is a, a big deal. We have accomplished that task. We now have 75,000 Chromebooks that have access to the internet. So students at JCPS, when they're riding the bus home, they can be on the internet and learning. When they are at the football field before practice, they can log on to the internet. They can have it in school and we can have 21st century learning. So that's a very exciting stuff. Our uh, resourcing our high poverty schools 
is a huge issue we're still, still dealing with, but providing the resources necessary, and this really gets into student assignment, for our schools that are highest in poverty, getting the most amount of resources. And I do believe this, students that have the least amount of resources in their home need to have the most amount of resources in their school. I think it's a fundamental belief we should have in this country. Unfortunately, that is not the case. We are building a system. Yes, we ask the community for an increase in taxes so that we could do that. We could put money into schools to support kids where it is needed most. And that's what we are doing um, with the help of the community and that tax increase to do that. Um, leadership and um, uh, development, um, obviously with principal development and making sure principals are prepared. Teacher shortages is a huge problem for us. Uh, to make sure that we have the capacity. I tell you, this is going to be a major problem in education for many, many years, a, a significant teacher shortage across the nation. And then finally, student assignment. And I thought student assignment was at the heart of change need. And so that's why we got into this future state. Pick these areas, let's build a future state, and decide what we want JCPS to look like in 25 years. So student assignment was a main one, had not been changed in 38 years in JCPS, 38 years. So let's briefly talk about the history of student assignment in this community. Prior to 1975, there was a Louisville City School District and a Jefferson County School District. So not exact, but if you wanted to view it this way, inside the Watterson Expressway was the City School District, outside the Watterson Expressway was the County School District. As you can imagine, the two school systems were very segregated in 1975. The vast majority of minority students were in the Louisville public school system. The vast majority of the uh, Jefferson County system was white students. In 1975, a court ordered desegregation occurred by a federal judge that said the two uh, districts had to combine, desegregate, and implement a busing plan, so to speak. That happened in 1976. In six months, and I think about this, this is what happened in six months, which was we're gonna combine two school districts. We're gonna have one more. We need to make policies for all of this one district coming together, one superintendent, one staff, all of those things that had to happen. And most importantly, implement an assignment plan that desegregated the two school districts. So from 1976 to 1984, you may remember what happened was students were assigned to a school based on the first letter of their last name. For instance, P, Folio. If I lived in East End, I may have said P now is required uh, to bus in order to segregate schools, and I might have had to get on a bus and go to Central High School, where a West Louisville student, if their last name qualified, they may be bused out to Ballard High School. South End to West End, West End South, in every direction, as you can imagine. For those eight years, about 55% of the students that had the burden of busing for diversity's sake on their shoulders were black students, 45% white students, pretty close to 50-50, although it was not exact. That happened for eight years. The big change came in 1984, which was the last significant change to student assignment, which at that time, the district decided that no longer or is it politically prudent or possible for us to continue busing white students from the east or south to west end? So we will continue diversity, but it will be solely on the shoulders of our students in West Louisville. So from 1984 until today, which we are working on right now, students, the, the West, West Louisville area, really including where we stand right now, although not many students reside here, was chopped up into many different uh, segments and the students in those segments were forced to bus outside of their community in order to achieve diversity. So simply put, I was the principal at Jaytown High School. If I lived at 9601, six mile lane, right across the street from Jaytown High School, and I moved into that residence, I could walk my child across the street and say, I'd like to enroll my child in this school, and say, you know, birth certificate, proof of residence, here they are. Okay, we're going to go ahead and enroll them. If it's in school, we'll get them in classes today. If at the same time I live on 41st and Market um, and I move in and walk across the street to the academy at Shawnee, I would walk in and say, 
I would like to enroll my child in school. And they would say, no, I'm sorry, your school, your enrollment school, and you have no other choice, is Valley High School. Now, where's Valley High School? It's about 20 miles south down Dixie Highway. And so that family, however they could get there, would have to get out to Dixie Highway, 20 miles away, in order to enroll their child um, in a JCPS school with no other option unless they were accepted to a magnet. And that is occurring today to the point where when we say we value diversity in Jefferson County in our schools, 95% of the students that bear the burden of diversity are Black students predominantly from West Louisville. And I find that to be one of the most inequitable things the district has done um, at any point and felt very committed to making that change. Further, the elementary and the middle and the high school plans were designed independently, all right? So they were designed by, so let's, let's just play this out, three separate task force, so to speak. You work on elementary, you work on middle, you work on high, draw the lines up and bring them back and we'll issue. But nothing was done in conjunction with each other. So when we look at those blocks that were chopped up in West Louisville, a student who was assigned to Cameron Middle School in the far east end of Louisville out by Ballard High School would also then be assigned to Valley High School in the far south end. So a West Louisville parent could have a middle school child in Camera and a high school child in Valley Station. And us expecting the parent to be involved in the child's education. And this was their assignment. And this impacted, this impacts every student, not just West Louisville students. Right now, as of today, we have 97 feeder patterns between middle and high schools in Jefferson County. 97. We have high schools that have 14 different middle schools that feed into that high school. Excuse me, seven middle schools, 14 elementary schools that feed into that high school. We, if I look at um, just for instance, being the principal at J-Town, there were eight different middle schools that would come into J-Town High School. These are kids assigned, not even choosing to come to the school. And so that's had a negative impact on our students and student belonging in the fact that we don't have predictable patterns for parents. If I move into a certain area of town, I know this is my elementary option, this is my middle school, this is my high school, and here are a list of magnets that I can choose from. And so we have gone down from 97 to about 19 feeder patterns between our middle and high school with our new proposal. So um, this positively impacts every kid in Jefferson County. And then finally, our magnet system. And we have to look at what the purpose of magnets were. Most of our magnets were developed in 1984. Right now, DuPont Manual is celebrated as the best in Jefferson County, an amazing school with, with a, you know, amazing students doing unbelievable things. Prior to 1984, DuPont Manual was one of the lowest performing schools in the district and in the state. It served the community uh, as a reside school. Oh, and so it was a part of the Louisville Public Schools and then it served that specific community. So very high poverty. Overnight in 1984, the district decided to implement a series of magnets that would attract white families to stay in Jefferson County Public Schools and to be attracted to the urban core without doing what's best practice, which is ensuring that our magnets are the ones that have the diversity that serve kids from all over the community. And so what we have right now, um, about 86% of our students of color in JCPS don't even apply for a magnet. Only 14% apply. So that much fewer get in. So right now we have a system where our magnets are set up to serve um, our least needy students and our least diverse populations are usually in our magnets. So that was another major thing we had to attack when we looked at these. So seeing all of these things, we knew this required a change. We had to make a big change. Prior to the pandemic, we were taking a look at middle and high school. Let's fix middle and high school first. That hadn't been done since 1984. And then secondly, phase two, let's go to elementary. I'm glad we did not do that. Silver lining from the pandemic. Because when we came to about last fall, we said, okay, it's time to change our student assignment. We've talked about this too long, but we need to change all three levels and have one student assignment plan instead of three student assignment plans. 
And so now we have an elementary, a middle, and a high school student assignment plan that we can overlay together. The elementary and the high school zones are exactly the same. So the Ballard Elementary um, zone, so to speak, the clusters, is exactly the same as the high school. So a family who lives in that community knows here are my five choices of my elementary schools in this community. Here is the middle school I would go if I choose to my resides. Here's the high school that I would go. And I can also, once again, apply for the many magnets that JCPS offers. So we offer such a, an array of school choice, but making sure every child has choice, which we haven't done before. So having all three student assignment plans going from that 97 to 19, you know, we looked at, this is the honest truth, in 1984, when the student assignment plan was drawn, it was drawn in a room at Van Hoos with maps and balls of string and pins because there were not computers at the time to do this. And so many of our boundary lines cut in between neighborhoods. And so we see all throughout this community a line right through a neighborhood where one side of the street goes to one school and the other side goes to the other school. We used a company, Cooperative Strategies, who has done, who have done about 55 different cities, and they use our major thoroughways um, as a dividing line for schools. So as much as we possibly could, Dixie Highway is a, is a quarter. So on one side would be one school, the other side would be the other school boundary. We try to do the same with, with roads like the interstates, Bargetown Road, those things that we can look at and say, these are dividing, clear dividing lines when you look at a map. And so that helps us a lot too, to make sure we have continuity between all um, of our student assignment plans. Probably the biggest change though, was our change and we created what's called a choice zone. And the choice zone are the students that are in predominantly West Louisville that have been forced to go to a school outside of their community for many, many years and had no choice in the matter because they weren't even applying to magnets. And so here's what we had happening. We had a student waiting for a bus on 22nd and Broadway, for an example, at 6.30 in the morning to get on the bus and go to Ramsey Middle School. That was their assigned option. If you don't know Ramsey Middle School, it is at Billtown Road in the Gene Snyder, past J-Town. And so students would ride from West Louisville all the way out to uh, really as you close in on Fisherville and Spencer County to go to middle school without another choice or option. And then they may have to go to PRP High School. That is the pathway that many of our students took through JCPS. So essentially our belief and what we have proposed and passed is that we create a choice zone for the students, the neediest students in our community, the ones that are underserved and have tended to be more underperforming that we have to move the needle on. And to give those students options, make sure they have choice. And so students have not had choice to stay close to home in West Louisville. It's probably the one call we get the most from families in student assignment is, we would like to go to that school across the street. Unfortunately, we don't have a middle school in West Louisville that we could serve the students. So we created a choice zone, which was to say, let's align those options first. So if this is the student in West Louisville who had to go out to Ballard High School, they get to go to Cameron Middle School. They have the option of the elementary schools, the middle school, the high school to stay aligned. Or they also have the option of an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school in West Louisville. And so every single family in West Louisville now has a dual resides or a choice that they can make for that school year, close to home or take the suburban option, so to speak, in order to serve their needs. But we also recognize that, you know, unfortunately we have a very segregated housing population in Jefferson County. And we were going to have to, if we're gonna follow the tenant of those that have the least amount of resources in their home have the most amount of resources in their school. We know in our choice zone, over 90% of the students are free and reduced lunch. And over 90% of the students are black students. And so in order to do that, we had to provide the appropriate support plan for our students. This was the process that we were out in the community talking about what it would take to make sure that we brought the, 
you know, the best possible choices for families so that it's not, we don't have any choice at all that families are actually struggling with. We have two great choices. Which one do we choose? And we want to make that local option for them the best possible option that they can have and to really struggle with that. So that includes a great facility, investing in our facilities, paying our teachers more. You know, our board has implemented um, a pay scale now where teachers who teach in a choice zone can make $8,000 to as much as $14,000 a year more. Paying our administrators more so we get the best principals and administrators in our choice zone schools. Making sure we have one-to-one -one technology, smaller class size, great programming for our students, great extracurricular activities. In short, investing in our schools so that um, you know, I, we can look at our schools and say, yes, that's high poverty school, but those students are being served with the greatest amount of support that we can possibly get. A lot of that is the result of the work on our tax case, which I'm proud to say that we have won, and we are investing all over the community, but specifically in our choice zone as well. So that was a big change for us. It does not start this coming year. It actually starts for 23-24. But I look forward to, to making sure that our families in West Louisville have great options. Now, one thing we have to do is build a middle school in West Louisville uh, because there has been no middle school built in West Louisville. We have Western Middle School for the arts, but that's been a complete magnet for many, many years. Uh, so we have to build a reside school and I wanna build the best possible facility for our students in that location. And finally, magnets. You know, magnets has been a big thing about how we change magnets to man, this is simply what our view, and you know, people get nervous about that. Well, those are the great, they're still going to be great schools. Here is what we wanted to make our magnets. First of all, magnetic. It is a program that attracts students for a type of learning. That's what a magnet school is. So if it is a STEM school, these are kids who are interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Certain type of learning, I would not have been. A performing arts school magnet. Every student in the school is passionate and interested in learning performing arts every day. So that's what a magnet, it has to be magnetic. Number two, there is transparency in how students get in or do not get into the school. So ensuring that we have models in place, lotteries in place that are transparent to families, criteria in certain schools that are in place that families know if I got in, this is why I got in. If I did it, that didn't happen. That has not been a part of our work in Jefferson County for many, for forever since magnets have been implemented. And finally, magnets should be schools that reflect the demographics of our student population in this district. And so our students of color should have the same access to our magnets as all students have. And so building in our plan, and by the way, that's just not my thoughts, that's Magnet Schools of America, their recommendations. So we're following the experts on this that have implemented them in many cities across America, and we have built in steps to ensure that those three things happen. We are increasing, because I do believe this, I want to say this, the more kids that raise their hand and say, I want to go to a school for a specific reason, the more they're going to be successful. Research shows that. So let's add to the magnet menu. Let's make sure we have more kids having those options. But let's make sure they're magnetic. They're actually magnetic. And if they're not, we change them. Number two, transparency of entry. And we're not kicking kids out of magnets. We are owning all of the kids, as like all schools do, to say the success of every child. We have to own that success as a district. And then finally, once again, um, to um, make sure that we see diversity in our magnets. So those are the changes we have made to our magnet programs. Simply put, these go into effect in 23-24 for all of the items I've just discussed. Um, they will be, un, you know, we say 23-24, but actually we have our showcase of schools right down here in October. And that is when we have to be ready to present to families, here are your options based on the new map. We do have a website available right now um, at our Jefferson County Public School website, and you can go to the school choice tab and click it, and anybody can type in what's my current uh, student assignment choices and what will be the future student assignment choices. 
And you will see how that changes if it does in better aligns for uh, pathways and also ensuring that every student has access to magnets all across this district. Our board passed that seven to zero on June 1st. I think it was the most substantial and important vote in this district's history. And I think it was critical that it was seven to zero because what we are saying right now with our students is our outcomes for students right now have to get better. There is no doubt about it. And so we have to come at this problem from many angles. Uh, that's what I talked about future state, but student assignment is one of those. We have an attendance crisis in this community and across this nation. Students in our choice zone right now in our high schools, 58% are chronically absent. In middle schools, 52% are chronically absent. I'm not saying that's all on the backs of student assignment. There are many reasons students miss a school, but imagine if you were that student on 22nd and Broadway and missed the bus. What's the likelihood that that child will get out to Ramsey Middle School at any point during the day? I was the principal at Doss High School, served many students from West Louisville. If they missed the bus, there was no TARP coming to Doss High School. So they were finished for the day. They had no chance to get out there unless somebody was able to drive them. And I do believe that's inequitable for families. I'm proud that we have finally changed that. Not only are we providing local options, I don't call them neighborhood schools. Neighborhood schools means you are forced to go to the school closest to your home. We are ensuring that everyone has that option, but we also have an array of magnet schools. But what we are doing different than most cities is we are putting the resources in to the schools and students who need it the most. So thank you, very passionate about this work. Um, can't wait to implement it all and get it going. Happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much, Dr. Polio. Uh, we do have some questions, some that have been submitted in advance by um, LBA Women's Lawyers and Charles W. Anderson Lawyers. And um, I'm going to go to Jamie Neal, who is representing the Women Lawyers Association, for our first question. This whole thing about resegregating schools. First and foremost, I want to say this. You know, whatever you split the numbers at, Louisville, Kentucky is one of the most segregated cities in America with housing and housing. All we've got to do is look at this street right here, 6th Street, and go down three blocks and look at the difference in 9th Street to really identify that 9th Street divide. And so on the other side of 9th Street, you know, we know poverty is much higher um, and diversity as far as mixed communities between black and white families and, and other ethnicities, um, you know, is um, very much based on communities. And so we are, as a school district are being asked to diversify our schools in an extremely segregated community. And so this is what I believe. If we are going to do that, if we are going to say we value diversity in our schools, which I clearly do, then I think every single family, every single student in Jefferson County has to bear that responsibility. It cannot just be our families in West Louisville are the only families that bear that diversity or that burden of diversity for the past 38 years. And so if we are going to do that and we value that, then we have to say we are all in, all of us, to do that. Right now, honestly, I do not believe there is an appetite in the community to go back to the 1976 model where all students um, are participating in or having the burden of that diversity placed upon them. So first and foremost, we've got to diversify our magnets. Our magnets have not been diverse 
That is first and foremost. We have magnets that have seats for students in our highest poverty areas, and that you know these are diverse population of students. And so it shouldn't just be our reside schools are the only ones that reflect diversity. It needs to be our magnet schools as well. So that's number one, providing those options. Uh, the second part of that is yes, we want diverse schools, but more importantly for me is outcomes, is ensuring outcomes. A part of our plan is having 23, 24 be a benchmark here for us on outcomes. Um, and then we build the outcome plan from that. Now, student assignment is not the only thing around outcomes. There's a, a whole lot of things that impact outcomes. So that's one part of it, but we will be reporting to the community goals that we have for student outcomes and how we are doing along the way based upon students who choose to stay home, so to speak, um, in the choice zone or students who leave and a combination of all of it. So we will have clear goals and targets for outcomes, but without a doubt, I think we are at a time when we have to say student outcomes are the most important thing that we value in education. Okay, this was another question that was submitted in advance and it, it really refers more to the specific workings of the plan. I have a child already enrolled in JCPS for kindergarten. Through the redistricting, a new school will be added to our cluster next year. Since we weren't able to put this school down as our first choice for the 22-23 school year, will we have that option for the 23-24 school year? So if I'm, I think I followed the question correctly. Um, so first and foremost, you know, I'll, I'll do it. Um, students are in their current clusters right now with the current plan. The new clusters begin 23-24. They begin with kindergarten, sixth grade and ninth graders only. We do not want to take kids and force them to leave their school. Um, and so a, a child, we don't want to say, you have to leave your school and go to another school. That is the most efficient way to implement a student assignment plan. Uh, is let's, everyone goes to a new school right now. That's the way it was done in 1976. However, efficiency we believe is not what's best for students. Student belonging is not uprooting them from their school and putting them somewhere else, especially if they're in the fourth grade or the seventh grade or the 11th grade. So ensuring first and foremost, some call it grandfathering that students have the opportunity to stay in their school. When we start K, six and nine in new clusters, families will have an opportunity to reapply in the new cluster if they would, especially if they have a younger sibling that would go there. Um, and so we will not have a grandfather for the younger sibling to go into the current cluster system. The sibling will go into the new cluster and the sibling will have the opportunity to apply and go to that cluster as well. This question goes to the um, additional funding that will be provided for schools in the choice zone. Schools in the Choice Zone will receive additional funding to help close achievement gaps attributed to socioeconomic inequalities. But will this funding be truly enough to overcome the many other barriers often connected to growing up in poverty, such as housing instability, food insecurity, health inequities, and exposure to trauma? How will progress be monitored to ensure that this additional funding is making up the necessary ground? Where will the funding come from, and how will it be sustained over time? So the simple answer to that is no, it's not enough. I mean, it's just not. I mean, there is nothing that JCPS can do uh, to completely overcome housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, you know, violence that students may face in the neighborhood, um, you know, all of the things that we talk about that can negatively impact education. I do, and, and I'm very clear and honest about this. I think it is a shame in the United States and America, that, that is, we always look to the school district first to say, what are you doing to mitigate housing insecurity? What are you doing to support your homeless students? And I would ask as the community, we have 6,000 homeless students in JCPS, 6,000. Over 6% 6 of our students are homeless, meaning they don't know when they leave school where they're going that evening. And you know, we think, that, and I can still remember being a principal at Doss High School, a student walking in the door and knowing they faced something immeasurable before they came in that day. You could see it on their face. And then me telling them to get to chemistry class because you have to learn the periodic table. I mean, it is just 
an absolute impossibility of what we ask of our educators often. However, I do believe once again, as I said in my comments, that those that have the least amount of resources need to have the most amount of resources in their school. So there are a couple of things first that you know, we are doing. We have earmarked $15 million out of the 54 million that we got with our new uh, revenue from our tax increase of 2020 that is earmarked for resourcing our high poverty schools. And so a school like Shawnee, on top of um, the funds that they have been given, I believe it's um, their budget, an additional one and a half million dollars that will go in many ways to support staffing, student supports, counselors, wraparound services, all those things that students need. So what you will see is schools in our choice zone where dollars spent per student will be substantively larger than any other school in Jefferson County. And I think that's the way it should be. I know that's the way it should be to support our students. We will have to see if it's enough. Is it enough? We will have to see. We will have to make adjustments on it and continue to invest in a community. It's also about investing wisely. I mean, that, that is an important part that we make sure we invest the funds and the things that impact achievement the most. And we report those achievement outcomes to the community on a regular basis. The second part I wanna talk about though, is what a lot of people refer to as hidden money in the school. So it is not budget money reported by JCPS. When you talk about kind of this hidden money, it is not illegal by any means. I don't want to make it sound illegal. It is the PTA dollars. It is the booster club dollars for the athletic um, department. It is a alumni association. So uh, we have elementary schools in our district that raise about $80,000 a year from families in the community. And it may be we need a new playground. And two weeks later, they've raised enough money, $60,000 to buy a new playground. We have other schools that raise about $500 in PTA dollars on the year and have no opportunity to do athletics. We have some that have quarter of a million dollars in booster club donations and revenue generation. We have others that have $20,000. So what we are requesting is that our foundation and this city work together to raise funds to support PTAs at our highest poverty schools. I was at Maupin recently. They have not had an active PTA where we give Maupin Elementary access to the same dollars that another school may have that has a very active PTA and we pick up all of those costs as a community. We've begun that fund, we're gonna raise those funds because those are also funds that impact student belonging. When students feel they have and, you know, a playground and a great facility at their school. When schools have great science labs, athletic facilities matter. They're symbolic to kids about how much, you know, the community cares in us. And so these are the ways we're going to invest budget-wise and also in those community dollars, those PTA dollars. It was almost like you knew what question I was gonna ask next. Um, that was a great segue. Um, one of the things that the, the new plan calls for is a baseline data report um, that will be due in the fall of 2023 to outline metrics such as academics, magnet enrollment, and importantly, students' sense of belonging that you just referenced. Um, can you tell me more about how you plan to measure a sense of belonging and what kind of district actions might follow based on the results of that data? So sense of belonging is uh, something that's very important to me as a principal. I mean, I can clearly state when I saw a student um, who had a sense of belonging, they felt a part of a school community. That's essentially what it is, is feeling as part of a school community. Research is clear about that. When students um, feel that sense of belonging or a part of a school community, the likelihood of them being successful dramatically increases and vice versa. When a child does not feel a part of the school community, a sense of belonging, the likelihood that they will be unsuccessful is very high. It is the, you know, the difficulty with school mobility in students. We have high poverty students who move from school to school year after year or month after month. We have about 250 students that switch schools every day in JCPS. 
So you can imagine having a sense of belonging or feeling a sense of community in a school where you move schools is gonna be very challenging. Having said that, it is not the easiest thing to measure. First and foremost, what we use is survey data. The survey data for us has been very clear in recent years when we survey students. The students who feel the least amount of belonging in our schools, the least amount are black female students. The second is black male students. And it's not even close between black and white students. And so the students are telling us something there. So a part of that, yes, I believe, is given the opportunity for students to stay close to home if that's what the family chooses. More importantly, you have a choice. When a student and a family feels like they have a choice in where they're going to school, the likelihood of that sense of belonging is much higher. But on top of that is providing great programs. So we have curricular programs that are really, really important. Academies of Louisville programs, um, our Explore programs now in our middle schools, which are designed to make learning relevant, where a student might be working on a nursing certification to become a nurse or a welding certification, um, or the law program at Central High School. You know, all of these are examples of kids being involved in a curricular program. It could be music, it could be art, but when kids are a part of a great program, they see we're investing in those programs, they have instruments, they have supplies, they have what they need, they're gonna be more engaged in school and more likely to be successful. Then you have co-curricular programs, things like robotics clubs, that may be, you know, debate teams, things that are related to curriculum, but getting kids involved. The more kids that are involved in co-curricular programs, the more successful they will be. And then finally, extracurricular. You know, all of those clubs, activities, sports, athletics, things that kids get involved in. The research is clear. The more we get kids involved in these things, the more successful they're gonna be. Unfortunately, right now, our children in poverty are not participating in high enough rates in extracurricular activities. So we have to invest in that. First and foremost, we have to give them the opportunity to stay close to home. I know at Goss High School, I had kids who would tell me I would love to participate in that. But I've got to get on the bus and go home because if I don't, it's going to be an hour and a half ride for me to get home after that activity. And so giving kids the opportunity to participate and giving them great resources our athletic facilities should be top notch for our kids. Our athletic facilities are an embarrassment compared to other communities around us. And quite frankly, to Fayette County Public Schools in Lexington, an absolute embarrassment because we haven't invested in our athletic facilities. I think that matters to kids. You know, having good uniforms, good equipment, the things they need to be successful matters to kids. And when they get involved, they're much more likely to belong. And so we will be reporting that data and most importantly, that we are increasing that sense of belonging year by year as we work through the student assignment plan. I'm gonna ask one more of the questions that were pre-submitted and then if anybody here in the group has a question that they would like to, to ask, um, we'll open it up for, for that as well. Um, the student assignment plan calls for increased pay for experienced educators to be hired into school choice zones. Is this truly feasible in our current climate when we're already facing a nationwide teacher shortage attributed to burnout, the effects of the pandemic, and a decline in students seeking undergraduate teaching degrees? So um, first and foremost, let me talk about the teacher shortage because I think it's important. It is a crisis that uh, will compound over the next decade and beyond. I met with assistant superintendents today we were talking and I said on July 14th of next year, we will be talking about vacancies and teacher shortages. July 14th of next year and the following year. And for the rest of your career, that's what we will be talking about. And it will only get worse from this point forward if the data that what we are showing is of teachers retiring and those that are coming out of post-secondary teaching programs to get their certification continues to dwindle. That is a reality we face. That is something this nation is going to have to deal with. There can be many reasons. We could do a whole other session on that right there. But it is a teacher shortage all across the board. Um, early in my career, early as a principal, 2007, 8, 9, 10, I would have never thought about teacher vacancies. We have them everywhere now. And this is in every county and every city in America. And we are going to have to take this problem seriously if we are going to mitigate that. I hope it's not too late. 
I really do. I hope it's not too late. We're being proactive about it, as many districts are, uh, but the challenge is real, you know, and I tell you, we, you know, we just do not have math teachers applying for jobs. Science teachers are not applying for jobs anywhere, and that's a real problem. But it's even a bigger problem at our high poverty schools. I've been the principal at a high poverty school, and I know the challenges that teachers face and that leaders face in those schools are more difficult. It is more difficult, and therefore, it is much more difficult to keep teachers in these positions. And so what I want to make sure we do, first of all, is acknowledge that it's more difficult by paying them more work. The kids come to you with many, many challenges. Just the mobility alone, 250 students changing school on a daily basis, meaning I may be a teacher with a new student in my class every day of the school year. That is a challenge for a teacher, a real, real challenge and a school. And so that's just one example of the challenges um, that are brought. But more importantly, as a principal at Doss High School, I knew that teacher retention was the most important. You know, that we had a group of young, hungry teachers, and I would have put them up against anybody. And that's why I, I'm not a fan of the good school, bad school narrative, because really it is just all about poverty versus students with means. And we all in this country seem to think that a, high, that a good school is one with a collection of high achieving students. And I, you know, I believe a great school is what the adults do in the building to meet the needs of the schools. And so at DOS, I had a bunch of teachers I would put up against any school, great school. But we gotta keep them there. We gotta keep them there. And I think that requires, I know that requires an investment in our teachers to say, if you're gonna work in our highest need schools, you're gonna make more money. If you choose to go to a lower need school, that's gonna be a pay cut. And so um, it is sustainable in the fact that we can pay the teachers that. I do not believe our current model nationally in staffing our schools is sustainable though. We did also just get one question in from um, someone on Facebook. Uh, they, they said, I have three kids in elementary school at the same time. Our oldest is enrolled at a school that leaves our cluster next year. I understand she'll be able to continue at her school, but will, it be, will there be an opportunity for our younger kids to attend the same school so they can all be together, or will we have to split between two elementary schools? So depending on whether it's a magnet or a cluster school, there is always the opportunity to apply for schools. So the, the brief answer to that, either way, whether it's a magnet or outside a cluster, the families would have the opportunity to apply to be in that school with the other sibling, although that would not be guaranteed. So it's important that we say that would not be guaranteed, um, which is a challenge for us. You know, it's a real challenge. We wanna keep families together. It has been a challenge with magnets about, you know, families want a sibling guarantee option so that they can go to the same schools. But what we found is many of our magnets that are smaller, siblings would actually take up every seat and it would greatly limit any open seats to students uh, throughout the community. And so, um, you know, we encourage that application process. We want our families to be together, uh, but the way to ensure that they are together is that they stay within their cluster um, at a school. So they will have the opportunity to move within the cluster. They won't have to move their older child, but they can apply for the other students to be in that school. At this time, I'd love to open it up to any questions from our group here on, on um, in person here at the, the Global Bar Center. Do we have any questions from our audience? Yes. Um, you talked about the importance of trying to make the magnet schools reflect our community and increase diversity. You talked about some of the ways that um, this plan will work toward that, but it sounds like part of the problem is just applications. And so what's the plan to promote those schools and try to, to get more um, involvement from the diverse community just to be attracted to a private school? Yeah, so a lot of that is teaching our families about their options. Um, and so I don't believe JCPS has done a good job about, you know, with that. We haven't provided the staffing necessary. We've had one person that is assigned to uh, outreach to community about student assignment. And so one person cannot do that. So we have increased those number of folks um, who have outreach. We plan on doing uh, a multitude of community events, especially in our choice zone. 
because our choice zone is seeing the biggest change, but we want to be there to answer questions, to be in the community, not to say you have to come to Van Hoos, you have to call central office to get your options. We want to be in the community. You know, that is first and foremost. A second big part of that is streamlining the application process. I'm a JCPS parent. I also know it's not easy to apply. There is a multitude of challenges to get by and to get into uh, many of our magnets, and that prevents a lot of families from applying. So we have a technology platform, one stop, one shop, all that will be implemented in the fall uh, where we can go and say, okay, here is our platform. Let's go ahead and apply and get you to your options of where you want to apply to based on your family's interests. And then finally is making sure that we don't put roadblocks in the way from keeping families to apply. So I'll give an example. Um, a performing arts elementary school, if or even a high school, if we require a professional headshot of that child to be to apply to the school, we are putting a roadblock in the way that says you can only apply if you have the ability to go do this. Uh, you may be an unbelievable, you may be the most talented in performing arts we have in the entire city, but may not have access to go getting a headshot. Um, or to come uh, into a requirement to tour the school beforehand. And a, fam a parent has to be there to tour the school. With the if a family doesn't have the ability or access to do that, we're putting a roadblock in the way. And so that's happened for many, many years. So pulling away those roadblocks and saying, apply, show the interest that you have in this particular magnet. The vast majority of our magnets will be lottery. It will be designed in order to ensure that we have diversity based on our lottery. And then families will know if you got in or didn't get in, it was because you fell at a certain number in the lottery. I think we have time for one more. Anyone else has a question? Be okay with us going ahead and jumping in. Fire. Let's get in there. I was going to ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Polio, I know that uh, you've been talking about the teacher shortage here today, and uh, I know it was the Board of Education that uh, passed the new emergency certification. I wanted to see if you could talk about how that could help JCPS address the teacher shortage. Anything that you guys have already looked at for that, you already have people coming to you sorry, about board it. passing an emergency certification. The uh, emergency regulation for the alternative route to teaching, a new certification, option nine, I think is what it's called. It was so probably it. talking about what we, we do with our um, um, teacher internship program, which is we essentially, um, so right now what we have done before the teacher internship program was to really uh, hope and work with our university partners that they are producing enough certified teachers coming out for us to hire. Uh, JCPS, like many other districts, we have a recruiting team that is going nationally to try to bring teachers into our district. But every school district in America is doing the same, or every large district is doing much of the same thing and fighting over the same candidates. Um, so we also had to make sure that we built a program that was certifying our own. So we had, you know, what we found was several hundred people inside of JCPS or in the community who had a bachelor's degree, but did not have a teacher certification. And so what that requires is if they want to be a teacher, I have to go back to school full time, take 30 some hours of education classes. Most folks can say, I, I can't afford to do that. I have to have a job. I have a family. So our teacher internship program essentially provided in collaboration with U of L, uh, we would put them in a classroom and hire them as a, at the level of an instructional assistant. They would work with a master teacher in the classroom Monday through Thursday. They'd go to class all day on Friday, but they would be paid to do it. So they would have a job. We put about 110 teachers or something in that range. Uh, don't quote me on that exact number. It's in the hundred, um, I believe, that we uh, put. But make sure to check on that before you write that. Um, including this year's class um, into JCPS classrooms and certifications. It's also making sure we focus on bringing minority teachers into the classroom. Um, so we're proud of that. But once again, I say that's a, that's a small dent in the challenge that we face. Um, we have 6,500 teachers in JCPS. 
Um, you know, four to 500 new teachers a year is what we usually hire. And when the, as the pool dwindles, it becomes much more challenging to fill every one of those classrooms. And that is, um, you know, in American education, a major challenge moving forward. How many new teachers have been hired this coming year compared to the ones we lost? And are we in a better place this coming forward than last fall? Uh, well, they're still in the process of that. I, I, I don't have the data for you. I'm sure that they can give you the data. I mean, we have people that are in the process of being hired right now, haven't finished their coursework or finishing. So it's tough to say until we get uh, closer to the school year. But, you know, early indications are we look like we are in about the same situation we were last year um, in that ballpark. So some vacancies, we're challenging our schools to look at things differently. Um, and so we're, we're doing things differently as well to make sure that we have a certified teacher for every classroom possible. But um, it's going to be very similar to what it was last year. And you have any comment on the lower judge ruling that the state law that would restrict the authority of the school board is unconstitutional? Um, happy to say that, um, you know, our board of education, myself, have, especially these past six months, have been passed incredible stuff together. So. Happy we can continue on with the work we're doing as a um, you know a team of eight people to make sure that we change JCPS um, positively for the long run. Okay. I appreciate it. Hey, Brad. Good. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, any question why we would want to hear from the uh, superintendent of schools at the LBA will has learned, if nothing else, at least in the last day or two, that there is definitely an intersection between our legal community and our public education community. Um, and I will, I was on a personal note, as a product of the JCPS schools myself, and as the daughter of a former public school uh, principal and central office administrator, I know how much you care about what you're doing to, for this community and for the students, and I think it's an incredibly important issue. I'll admit I don't have children myself, so I am a little bit uh, distracted from it, but I think it's incredibly important, not only for our community, but for um, the future of our youth in our community and for what Louisville wants to become. So Dr. Fondeo, I really appreciate your time and joining with us today. Yeah. Uh, yeah.